Want to achieve network marketing success? Then you're in the right company. Hello, and welcome to Leave Nothing to Chance, hosted by networking marketing giant, John Solider. Learn everything you need to know about the network marketing space from somebody who's actually done it. Join us every week for front row seats as we feature some of the finest and most successful personalities in network marketing. Leave nothing to chance. Join us now. Well, it is my uh, privilege and honor to uh, have part two with Ron Henley. And, and we had a great interview last week, Ron. I really enjoyed it. I think you did too. And oh yeah, and, and it was so much fun. I said, hey, let, let, let's do a second one. And we've got two other ones that we'll talk about uh, today. One that's confirmed and the other that mm. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. But uh, just kind of to review a little bit, Ron, um, I know that Rich Schackenberg was such a significant player i mean he's really kind of the atom of the industry if you want to just talk about him a little bit further yeah uh rich golly what an incredible human being uh where do you start with something like that i mean he he is the he is the linchpin of this whole thing he can be traced back to the very very beginning everything can be traced back to him it all started the california vitamins in 34 changed their name to neutralite in 39 they became a network marketing company in September 1st, 1945, and sales started to climb. Rich was working, uh, he owned a uh, coin laundromat in Gate City, California, and uh, a neutralized salesman came to see him. And it was the typical story, you know, this guy is so bad, I could just kill this thing if this guy's doing that well. So he joined Neutralite in 1948, uh, the beginning of 1948, and brought. He was an avid student of success. He studied everybody. He, I mean, Napoleon Hill, of course, but uh, um, all the guys that were back there, Orson Sweat and Martin, a lot of people that, that they haven't even heard of, but they were the success pioneers as well. Even uh, Barnum, he, he studied Barnum too, P.T. Barnum. He wrote a book called The Art of Money Getting. He was a very successful guy. And he had a lot to say. He took all that success mindset stuff, and he was the first person I ever heard say personal development with a pay plan. Hmm. That was his entire thing. He brought that into his organization, and Neutralite exploded. It exploded. He built the largest com- uh, group in the entire company. A year later, uh, Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel, who went on to start Amway, actually joined his downline in 1949, a year later. So he is the granddaddy of them all, man. Amazing. Amazing. And, and you have, in, and I'm reading some of your writing from uh, Larry Thompson's uh, Millionaire Training book. And uh, yeah, he was kind of descended from Napoleon Hill, Orson Sweat Martin, uh, Martin uh, Wallace T. Waddles, of course, uh, predecessor of Hill with uh, Science of Getting Rich, Dale Carnegie, of course, uh, George Klassen, James Allen, and more. And just Hey, just a side note, by the way, for everybody's uh, listening, Ship, there is a new um, Amazon Prime production of a movie about James Allen's as a man thinketh that I watched the other night. So just for everybody that hasn't seen that yet, probably on Netflix, I imagine too. So really well done. Yeah, well, good. I'm looking forward to seeing it. So Ron, I want, I want to read you something else here that you wrote in the introduction to, to uh, the millionaire training book. And I just love this and love to get your comments on it. You wrote it, of course, but I love your comments. I read it the other night and I got goosebumps. Uh, we are all part of the California vitamin company. We are all part of Neutralite. We are all part of Abundavita. We are all part of Neutral Bio. We are all part of Amway. We are all part of, of Ovation. Uh, we are all part of Mary Kay. All part of Bestline. All part of Holiday Magic. All part of Coscott. All part of Dare to Be Great. All part of Slender Now. All part of Golden Youth. All part of Herbalife and many, many more. And that is like the DNA of our industry uh right there described in those companies that a lot of people never heard of i mean uh, uh ovation for example tell the story with ovation a little bit because I, I that's a really interesting story that was kind of the i think the yeah. first skincare company to multi-level if i'm not uh, incorrect uh, no there were uh, a few others around about that time um earl Schultz started ovation 
1964, 63-64, when Nutribio folded. He, uh, he wanted to get completely out of the vitamin supplement business because everything that the FDA was doing, and he just didn't see how he could serve people and play by rules that he thought were very unfair. So he just shifted gears and uh, started Ovation Cosmetics, which is still in business today. Amazing. Amazing. And, and then, you know, you talk a little bit about some of these uh, leaders that were developed. And so I want to go back to uh, Nutri Bio in 1957. I yep. believe it was July 57. Yeah. July 57. And that's kind of where Earl Schulf, uh and Rick Schackenberg got together. No, they got together in Abundavita. Abundavita. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they eventually wound up after a falling out with the owner of Abundavita. Yeah. They wound yeah. up to tell, tell that story a little bit because that, that has so much significance for some of the people we're going to talk about next. Yeah, it's a, it's a theme called Take Care of Your People and Keep Your Promises. That's what it's <laughs> called. Uh, when uh, J.B. Jones, Dr. Jones, wanted to start a vitamin supplement company, first of all, he was a direct student of Napoleon Hill. Mm. And he got his start going around town. He did TV shows, radio shows, talking about the Napoleon Hill laws of success. And he was giving these lectures and he started getting this feedback from people, you know, God, I wish there was some way I could put this into practice and, you know, and work, work with you somehow. And he saw that the uh, supplement business was just exploding. He saw it was going on with Neutralite. And uh, I think Shackley wasn't around yet. They started in 56. So he saw what was going on and he wanted to be a part of it. And he had been watching Rich Schnackenberg and Neutralite. And Rich became very, because of everything that was going on with Meidinger and Castleberry, who became the master distributors on September 4th, 1945, September 1st, 1945, they were in charge of the whole deal. And they were just getting in trouble hand over fist. Because, and they wouldn't listen. He tried to talk to them. And he even actually tried to buy controlling interest. He tried to buy the company outright from Renborg, but Renborg wouldn't sell. So he tried to buy controlling interest and Renborg wouldn't let any of it go at the time. So he was just real disheartened. So uh, JB Jones had been watching all this stuff going on, saw, witnessed everything that, that Rich had done in a, in a, yeah, in a bond divide. No, oh, in a neutralite. I'm sorry. All these companies start running together. If you don't watch it, <laughs> yeah. he watched what he had done in neutralite and knew that he was very disheartened. So Rich had actively stopped building. He hadn't resigned his position, but he actively stopped building, hoping he could figure out a way to make it better. Well, Jones saw what was going on with him and came up to him and said, look, I've got this idea for a new supplement company. It's going to be less expensive. It's going to be, you know, with people like you on board, it can be a better product. And we can bring your whole personal development with a pay plan philosophy to it. And a matter of fact, he, he uh, combined abundance and vitamin and got abundant vita. Mm. So from the very inception, that was the cornerstone that the company was going to build on instead of an afterthought. So Rich was very excited about that. And uh, he was going to come on as vice president of training right away. And uh, so he resigned his position with uh, Neutralite and went on full-time with uh, Abundavita. This was in 1953. Mm. That's how they built that thing. Uh, Earl Shelf had a, was pressing pants at a department store called Desmond's living in Long Beach, California. I know his nephew and his nephew still has one of Earl's old smoking jackets from Desmond's <laughs> from back in the day. It's, it's really cool stuff. I'm trying to get my hands on it. So we'll see. But, um, Earl had a neighbor named Marvin Went. Earl would go out, work 10, 12 hours a day, pressing suits, come home and just be too tired to move, basically. But his next door neighbor kept saying, look, you need to come hear this guy. You need to come hear this guy. He, he's got a lot of great ideas and it's something I think you would like. Well, he and his wife, Flossie, had been putting the guy off for like two months. Finally, one day they forgot to call him and tell him they wouldn't go. So he showed up at their door ready to go. And Earl looked at Flossie and said, well, 
he's never going to leave us alone. So maybe if we go, he'll leave us alone. That was, that was their entire thing there, their entire strategy was just to get Marvin Went to quit bugging them. So they go, and of course, Earl, being a student of success himself, was blown away by what J.B. Jones had to say about Napoleon Hill and the laws of success. Rich got up and talked about a few things that about uh, hang around and we'll show you how to put what you've learned here into action. Heavily paraphrasing that, by the way. So Earl did, and he, Rich got up there and a few of the distributors talked about this new idea called the Bunda Vida. Jones talked about how he made that happen how Rich became part of the company, the philosophy of the company, what they were going to do. And Earl was just blown off of his, of his seat. He'd been looking for something like this. At the time, he was making $100 a week. Of course, that's a whole lot better than Jim Rohn's $57 a week. Mm. That's 100 bucks a week. And he was working 60, 70 hours a week to get that 100 bucks. This was also in 53. The company had just started. So he joined right away and was actually the very first person in the company to buy a case of 12 bottles of product. <laughs> everybody else would buy one for themselves and maybe one or two to sell. He bought a case and said, I'm hitting everybody in the neighborhood. And he did. But here's an interesting thing. Everybody talks about, and I do especially, what a great person Earl Shelf turned out to be. The funny thing is, is I always tell people, don't worry about when you first start, you have to be bad to be good. You've got to go through that learning curve. The very first door that Earl Schof knocked on, he forgot his own name. So don't fret it. You know, you just get out there and do the do and it'll take care of himself. But the two men rapidly rose. Earl became a star in the company and became vice president of sales. So uh, Earl was vice president of sales. Uh, Rich Schnackenberg was vice president of training. They had another guy that came on named Harry Ebert that produced all the films and produced all the sales brochures and all the media consultant kind of guy. So Earl and Rich went around the, co the country because by this time, Jones wanted to do other things. So he said, you guys go around the company, I'll go around the country and build the company. So they agreed to it. And uh, Jones said, once sales reach a million dollars a year, or yeah, a million dollars a year, I'll give you guys stock options. Mm. They had everything all written out in the company. He said, it's a private company, but if you'll put in some sweat equity and help me build this thing, I'll reward you with stock options and some other perks. So the guys did, they poured themselves into it. They'll go around the country and they were in Pensacola, Florida in 1955. That's where Jim Rohn came to the San Carlos Hotel guided by another friend of his that used to work with him at Sears that was doing very well with the Bunda Vida. Same story. You got to come and hear this guy. He's rich and easy to talk to. Got a great philosophy about life. So Jim goes, and of course, he's blown away as well by what Rich and Earl had to say at that meeting. He did not have the money to buy. So he borrows the $200 from his parents mm. to buy his kit and to get some inventory to get going. Of course, he quickly paid them back. He's quick to say. He was quick to always tell us. He said, I quickly paid them back. But uh, that's how he got started. And uh, the guys just went around the country. And Jones said, look, you've got this in hand. I'm going to go around the world on a vacation. I'm going to take a, a, a yacht, and I'm just going to go sell the seven seas and see the world. I'll be back in a year, year and a half. You guys, you got the company. It's all good. So he takes his time off, and Earl and Rich really take hold of this thing. They grab the bull by the horns and the thing just goes off like a rocket. I mean, this thing, it became just incredible what they were able to do. They quickly passed the benchmark that Jones had set for them. And Jones comes back thinking that he's going to come back to a company in shambles. It's going to be in complete ruins. These guys can't do anything without me. Well, they tripled the company while he was gone. <laughs> He comes back and to make a long story short, his ego for all the good that he did, for all the prosperity that he preached, his ego could not take the fact that they did this without him. He called him into the office and said, I'm not giving you stock options. And not only that, I'm capping your pay. <laughs> so, you know, Rich said, I'm, I'm done. 
he actually he called Rich into the office. Earl was out training somewhere. He called Rich into the office, and Rich said, "Well, that's that's just not going to work. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off and start my own thing." And he told Earl what had happened. I forgot. I think Earl was over three or four states away at the time in Nevada or something. Yeah, it was one state over in Nevada. And uh, Rich called him and told him what happened. He quit on the spot and said, "You know, I'm with you. I'm coming." Er Harry Ebert quit. And the three of them together sat in Rich's living room trying to figure out what to do. Mm. And they came up with their own supplement company. They found a uh, chemist named uh, Earl Hillemond that was uh, just top of the line. I mean, I've got a video of Rich talking about him and what an incredible guy he was. He gave them top-notch products that had never been seen before. So they were trying to figure out a, a name for it, and it was actually Earl's wife, Flossie, who came up with better nutrition through biochemistry. Hmm. So they'd made it NutriBio. They, could, that, that, they had the name, but Earl was equally, and Rich were equally qualified to run that company. So they said, how are we gonna decide? How do you think they decided? Coin toss. Coin toss. <laughs> it. Rich won the coin toss. So he became, I mean, Earl won the coin toss. So Earl became president. Rich became vice, executive vice president of the company. And uh, they were very proud to say that they never contacted a single person in their undivided downline to come and join them in their new venture. Mm. They had full expectations. They planned as though nobody would join them. And they were going to start from scratch and start knocking on doors and building a client list on their own. Well, when people found out what was going on, they too were tired of Jones ego. So a bunch of them left and joined NutriBio on them on, on their own, including Jim Rohn who left and under the direct tutelage of Earl and rich, he just, he rose to the top quick. I mean, they were really able to give him the, the attention that he needed and desired he proved that he was a worthy student and he grew and grew and grew. And very quickly, he hit the top of the pay plan, which was general coordinator. And you made about um, 25, 35,000 a month at that point. And this was in the late fifties, early sixties. Wow. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's some money right there. So yeah, they, they left Abunda Vida because Jones had an ego and broke his promises to them. So there's a lesson in that. If you make promises, keep them and leave your ego at the door, man. Well, well I'll tell you what, there's a lot of lessons in there. I mean, every company owner should listen to this because we've all yes. seen it. I, I, we've seen, I, I was in a company a number of years ago that off of that company, there's been eight other companies built literally, including my own, but, but seven others that, that people left and have done extremely well around the world and owner just, you know, ego again. And uh, anyway, we, yeah. we, we can, we can go down that road, but if we've been a multi-level <laughs> a long time, boy, everybody's got one where they're going right now. Hey, I remember this one or that one, or I was in this one or that one. And, you know, ego, greed, arrogance, those three things will destroy a marriage. It'll destroy a, a, a ball club and it'll certainly destroy a network marketing Anything. company, a church, you name it. Uh, but the other lesson, as you share, that that's going through my head is something that's been said uh over the years uh by uh my mentor uh larry thompson and that's that you know your skills are transportable because those guys skills grew up at abunda vita but yep. they transported them to neutral bio and yep. uh and, and there's some other people that came with them i want to go through a list ron because it's such a it's such a who's who in in anybody who's been in self-development for the last 50 years knows every one of these names I'm going to say uh, to some degree, some better than others. But uh, you mentioned Jim Rohn, of course, and we talked about Jim a great deal last week. And of course, we'll probably wind up talking about him again next week uh, well, of course. with what we're going to do with our other guests. Uh, but let's talk about Bill Bailey a little bit, because Bill Bailey is, is just a huge, huge impact in the industry. Share a little yeah. bit about uh, Mr. Bailey's career. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Bill actually was born and raised in Caney, Kentucky which is not far down the road from where my country comes from in a town called Middlesbrough, Kentucky, right where Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky all meet together, mm -hmm. a place called Cumberland Gap. That's where we were from. Caney is not that far from there. So that's where Bill came up from. So he and I connected, being old Kentucky farm boys, we, we, uh, we connected that way. But Bill was an incredible human being. He, uh, he knew he wanted more out of life. He ended up going into the service. 
and used the GI Bill to get a direct uh, a degree in marketing. And uh, he actually, back then, they had what was called a five and 10 cent store. Uh, I guess Dollar Tree or something like that would be the closest equivalent today. Uh, so, but it was called uh, Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin stores, five and dime. Everything was, you know, a nickel, a dime, a quarter, something like that. And he actually bought a Ben Franklin franchise and had his own Ben Franklin store. Now, while this was going on, he had made friends with, uh, he actually went to college when he was getting his degree with Bobby DePew. That's how they met was in college. And somehow, I can't remember how Bobby met William Penn Patrick, but those two had become friends. And Bobby and William Penn Patrick had joined Nutribio already and were trying to figure out a way of who they could talk to. And Bobby said, oh, hey, I've got a guy that's sharp. Bill Bailey over here, and he owns a Ben Franklin store. So they go over there, and Larry will tell you this story. When uh, Bill, when they walked in to see Bill, Bill was sitting in the floor counting sewing needles. That's how tedious that job had gotten. He was counting sewing needles. <laughs> and uh, they came in and laid it all out for him and said, come on, we got a meeting you can go to and hear all about it. He was all in, and, of course, he joined and uh, Bill and William Penn Patrick and uh, Bobby DePew became general coordinators in the company, which again is the highest you can get. And uh, they, they did very well with that. And then Bill, after Nutribio folded, he waited, uh, after Nutribio folded, William Penn Patrick uh, started, this is kind of all tied in together. So I'm gonna be going left and right and it'll, it'll all tie up in the end. But William Penn Patrick, looking for another opportunity, passed a garage while he was taking a walk in San Rafael, California. And they were selling their entire stock of fruit scented cosmetics. It was a company called Zoline, and they were completely going out of business. And uh, Penn Patrick goes in there and says, Hey, how much for everything? And paid them 12,500 bucks for the entire company. <laughs> So with that stock and with what he had learned in Nutribio, he launched Holiday Magic, Holiday Magic Cosmetics. Bill Bailey was the very first president of Holiday Magic. Bobby DePew came in with Penn Patrick as well, and the three of them got, got Holiday Magic going. Uh, Bill and William Penn Patrick became very, very good friends. I mean, almost like brothers, almost like Earl Schoff and Rich Schneckenberg. They got into a little squabble one day, one of these little silly squabbles that if you don't watch what you say, you can't take it back. And Bill said to him, well, maybe I ought to just quit. And Penn Patrick, being angry and not thinking about it, said, well, just maybe you should. So Bill walked out. They both regretted it. But Penn Patrick went on building Holiday Magic. 1966, Bill Bailey took what he learned in Nutribio and at Holiday Magic and started Best Line Products. Started selling a soap called Ziff, a biodegradable soap. I mean, babies could drink it and it wouldn't hurt you. You'd blow bubbles, you know, but it wouldn't hurt you. And uh, that's how Larry got started two years later was in Best Line Products. So Bill came from a Ben Franklin store to Nutribio to Holiday Magic to starting his own company, Best Line, in 1966. And then in 68, our our friend and mentor, Larry Thompson, got started. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Amazing. Was there anything else that you wanted to know about Bill? or it Just, you know, his name, I never met him. I've had friends, obviously, Larry knew him, and, and uh, Jeff Weisberg knew him, and Jeff Roberti, I think, I had met him at some point. Uh, I never had the opportunity, but uh, his name comes up so often in the history book so to speak of network marketing and and uh, apparently he was a great speaker too from what i understand he was real he real was motivated so smart john it is unbelievable we used to have these conversations and i would tell him look bill i'm gonna re i had a little cassette recorder you remember you used to be able to hook a suction cup onto the receiver and you could record these conversations and i would tell him look i got my cassette player here i'm gonna record what you tell me so i can unpack it later <laughs> and he would get talking about this stuff and he would start talking about how quantum mechanics and quantum physics 
dictated why you were successful or a failure and how the past can pull you and how you can use quantum physics to break that, you know, and it, it was just crazy. And wow. he's the kind of person that while you're listening to him, you're following along just fine. You're like, okay, I get it. And okay. Yeah, I get that. And then when it's all over and done with, you feel like you've been in a car wreck. I mean, you're just, you're just sitting there and several times my wife would, would walk in and I'd be sitting there with this blank look on my face, having just got off the phone with Bill. And she would say, well, what did you guys talk about? And I'd go, I don't know. I don't know. I got, I got the recording here. I'm going to have to listen to it back and line by line, figure it out. He was just an incredible mind. He was, in, he was amazing. And Jim Rohn was floored by Bill Bailey. Jim always talked about this friend that he had that could go on vacation, come back and tell you about it, and it would be better than you going yourself. Wow. That was Bill Bailey. Wow. Because Bill would make a story come alive. He would use all of the sensory perception. He would tell you the smells, the taste, the sounds, the atmosphere, what the weather was doing, what this sounded like, and you felt like you were in there when he was telling you about where how something worked or whatever. Incredible. It was just incredible. incredible. And, you know, you you mentioned Bobby Depew. I know we, we talked about Bobby a little bit last week. Let's talk about yeah. Bobby a little more. Bobby somebody that, that I did have the privilege of, of spending time with and uh, really getting to know and just uh, such a nice gentleman. And just, you know, once again, another one of these guys that just was a big thinker and smart and intelligent and worldly. And you could talk to him about politics or, you know, 15 other subjects. And you knew sure. he knew just as much as he did about multi-level where's that. And that's not everybody in our industry. Unfortunately, There's a lot of guys you talk to in our industry. They're myopic. It's, they know our business, but they don't have a clue what's going on elsewhere. But Bobby was one of those guys that struck me that, well, you threw a subject at him and he had, he had some, some facts and some opinions and some ideas. on. So let's talk about Bobby a little bit. Bobby uh, got his actually he was a school teacher if I'm not mistaken he was either a math or a history teacher I can't remember but he was actually a school teacher when he got started selling cookware door to door he wasn't making enough money so he needed to supplement his income as a teacher and uh, this is another story that Jim Rohn tells that uh, he had this friend is what Jim will say he never mentioned Bobby by name but he said he had this friend that wanted to get into sales and his brother-in-law, Bobby's brother-in-law mocked him and said, you're not going to get into sales. Are you? You'll never make it. That made Bobby so mad that he swore he was going to be a success. <laughs> and he did, he became, he, he did very well selling cookware door to door. And uh, he said he would always take his brother-in-law out to lunch to rub it in his face and when it came time to pay the check, he always had a hard time finding small money. He would flip those hundreds out, you know, just to rub it in his face. And Jim used that as a lesson. You could, people can make you so mad that you can use that as a motivator to just go out and, and make it happen, you know. Mm. But Bobby was, uh, man, I mean, without Bobby, Jim certainly helped. Jim had the philosophical side of it. But without Bobby pouring into Larry Thompson the way he did, I don't think Larry would have been near the success that he turned out to be and then go on to make the impact that he made and is still making in our profession today. Mm. Yeah, you're Bobby, he was very, he was another intelligent, very intelligent person, as you well know, having sitting down and talked to him like you did that, that uh, Larry would tell you, he got the, in, the strategies and tactics of how to do this business, which really, and like you said about Bobby, he was very worldly. So he would talk about concepts that were universal. You could apply them certainly in network marketing, but you can apply them in every area of your life. They were just world philosophies, global philosophies that anybody could use. And he was uh, very smart, very quick on his feet, uh, could be soft-spoken at times. But uh, I just, uh, I don't know. Larry has some recordings that he made of Bobby giving a, uh, a presentation, I think it was, or some kind of sales training or something. And as far as I know, that is the only recording that has ever survived. I don't know if more were made, but as far as I know, personally, that's the only recording that ever survived of Bobby DePew. Wow. 
Wow, I didn't know so, that. What yeah, he's working to... on cleaning it up because it was yeah. recorded on a really bad machine. So he's got people in there trying to clean it up and make it where you can hear it. But everybody needs to hear Bobby. I mean, to me, that's how this whole thing got started with, with uh, this whole net network history thing. Network marketing history is Jim Rohn talking about Earl Shelf. And I was so blown away by Jim, July 15th, 1978, I was a 14-year-old kid. And I said, golly, I see, he keeps talking about his mentor. If I can find him and learn from him, that'll give me better insight into Jim's work. Plus, he, I'm sure he has stuff of his own to add. Didn't know he had died in 1965. Mm. So my search for Earl came up with all this over wow. the past decades. So, yeah, it's uh, people need to be able to hear. I wanted to make Earl Shelf a real person. Not just a reference in Jim's webinars and seminars and things like that. I wanted him to be real to people. Nobody knew what he looked like. Nobody knew what he sounded like. I wanted to change that. And uh, I'm glad that I made Earl real to people. I'm, I'm helping make the history of this profession real to people. And Larry, through what he teaches and shares about Bobby, plus with these recordings and maybe some other things he has, can make Bobby DePew real to people because mm. they need that. They need that important piece of the puzzle. Well, you, you, you know, we'll probably talk about this next week, but we might not, who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll go a lot of directions on our next call, but my, I met with Bobby a number of times, but the one day that I spent about seven hours sitting in, in the back of Larry's ranch in, in uh, out there in hidden Hidden Valley, I think it was. Hidden Valley, called. yeah. And uh, I only remember it because there's there's a famous salad dressing that comes from like down the street that I see on TV sometimes. I'm like, oh, I've been to that place, but anyway. <laughs> but I'll never forget that because you know, Sophia Loren was on one side of that estate, and the other side was uh, Tom Selleck. Tom so Selleck. we would take these three three uh, three wheel uh, motorcycles up into the mountains, you know, and uh, just to see if we could see Sophia Loren in the backyard, which we never did. I, I think we saw Tom Selleck one one time, and that was was nowhere near as exciting as seeing Sophia Loren. But uh, well, you say next door, but there was a lot of land in between them. I think it was 110 acres. If I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, it's not like you could stand at the fence and look no, over. No, and yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah. uh, we had a lot of fun up, up, up there. And uh, but having said that, that meeting with Bobby was so amazing because you can tell how he could do. And, and, and Larry used to talk about this a lot with him. He could do math calculations. I think he was a math teacher. Larry will, Larry will tell us one way or another. I'm, I'm thinking so, think so now, yeah. Because every pay plan that exists to this day has Bobby's DNA on it, sure including does. the way that I think. And I, I've constructed a few for companies that are still in business, I'm happy to say. And every one of them came really from the conversation with Bobby about how the math has to work and it has to work. Has to, and distributors don't understand this at times, guys. I hope I'm not getting anybody upset, but it's got to work for the company. The company's got to make, if a company doesn't make profit, they're not going to be there to pay it. And we, you know, when we mentioned some of these old companies, well, if they had made profit, they might be here today. Okay. So, you know, who knows? Maybe there never would have been an Amway or an Herbalife or a New Skin or whatever if some of these other companies had done uh, some things. So really, really important. And Bobby understood that because he had such a, a business mind and a mathematical mind when I met with him that I said, I see why this guy was able to do what he did because he, he understood, hey, here's a product. Company's got to get its part. Distributor's got to get its part. The tax man and the rent guy and everybody else have to get their part to have a functioning business. And he right. understood that those numbers so well and was so brilliant with them. But let's talk about another guy that came out of that 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 school. And that's John Fleming. John uh, John's still around with us. Uh, happy to say, still uh, shows yeah. up on different things. And uh, tell us about John. John. Incredible. Yeah, he's uh, he actually wrote the forward to the millionaire training. Is, uh, he got his start in Best Line as well uh, in 67. Uh, no, it was 69, a year after Larry did, he got in. Uh, and so did Les Brown, who we can talk about a little bit later. But uh, John Fleming, again, this profession, I tell people, get involved in a network marketing company. Even if you fail miserably, the skills and the attitudes that you learn from being around these people, these top performers, will serve you in every area of your life. So it's worth it to even, you know, if you, if you do the work and stick to the basics, you can't fail. I mean, that's just the bottom line. But people, you know, I even tell them, if you bomb out completely, you'll be better for the experience. But, uh, yeah, John Fleming took everything that he learned uh, and was actually uh, president of Avon West 
and brought the network at marketing aspect to Avon. And that company did extremely well. And once he retired from there, he's got, he's become this gig, gig economy expert. And he is the go-to guy, uh, John and the team that he's put together about how the gig economy works and, and understanding it, deciphering it, peeling it apart and putting it back together in a way that people can understand how their business relates to the gig economy. And Larry has picked that up, Larry Thompson, and he and Taylor do extremely well translating the gig economy into network marketing. So John is an incredible human being, very smart, very talented, just a good guy to know. Yep. Got, got to know John over the years. I, I would agree with all of that. Very, very, very nice person on top of everything else. Good, real, real, real good guy. And glad, glad he's still around. Another guy who's, who is still around, uh, Les Brown. And, and, you know, I'm boy, Les Brown. Wow. Talk about a, a powerhouse. I, I don't think, and I've seen some, you know, I've seen Ronald Reagan live and uh, seen some other, uh, uh, you know, politicians that were incredible speakers, but yeah. I don't think I've ever seen somebody that gets your juice going better than Les Brown. <laughs> I mean, that man can motivate, he can motivate the dead. I'm convinced of it, but the, talk about Les yeah. a little bit, because Les came out of that same company, which is, it, it's just amazing. All these guys were there. It's just incredible. And, and yeah. one, one organization. Yeah, I mean, without without uh, California vitamins becoming Neutralite, without Neutralite uh, spawning Abundavita, without Abundavita spawning Nutribio, and all the people that came out of there, Bestline being one of them, and uh, Les Brown joined Bestline in 1972. Is uh, he had actually gone to a hotel to meet somebody else. And while he was waiting for this person to show up, he heard Bill Bailey's voice through the wall. And what Bill was saying kind of got his interest. So he said, I think I'll just peek in the door here and see what was going on. About the time he did that, uh, Bill was finishing up, introduced Jim Rohn, who came up on stage and just totally knocked the legs out from under Les. Les had never heard anything like that in his life. Hmm. And he joined that day because of what he heard Bill and Jim say in that meeting that he stumbled on in a hotel that he had gone to to meet somebody else. So serendipity, and the fates sometimes guide you in exactly where you need to be at the right time. But uh, Les has since become, God, what can you say about this guy? He's like the king of motivation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I, I've, I've listened to him as a student of motivation and things like that, but I've also watched him as a student of public speaking. This guy, first of all, has raw talent but he has harnessed and worked on himself to where he can, he looks totally at ease, whether he's talking to one person or I believe if you had a million people in a room, he wouldn't be phased. If a million people were watching him, he wouldn't be phased. He would still be less. He has the, the, the crescendos and he knows when to bring it down and he, he knows to, to speak low, to make a point and then ramp it up to get the juices going. It's just, he's an artist is what he is. And he's so talented and he's so smart and he's just got this personality that is perfect for what he does. And I think that's why he continues to make the impact on the world that he, that he does today and will continue. Amazing. Amazing. And then of course, so uh, you, you mentioned earlier, William Penn Patrick, and I, I don't know a lot about him. His name's, his name's come up in conversations with Larry. It's come up in conversation with Ron Reynolds, Charlie Regis, uh, other guys that were around the industry a long time, but uh, I don't know much about him. Share, share a little bit about him if you would. Well, uh, William Penn Patrick, like I, we talked about earlier, got his start in Nutribio with Bobby DePew and uh, Bill Bailey and uh, started uh, Holiday Magic Cosmetics in 1967 with Fruit Scented Cosmetics. Uh, here's, I want to say this because it needs to be said. A lot of these companies, there were no laws, there were no guidelines when these companies started doing what they did back in the day. They were trying to figure out like you said before, a company has to make a profit to be able for the distributors to make money, for everybody to get paid, because you got to get the products made. Those people have got to be paid. The people who make your, your boxes and your bottles, they've got to be paid. Everybody's got to be paid, and this thing turned a profit. So it was never, and Bill Bailey and I had several talks about this, it was never coming from a place of what can I do to get over on everybody? It came from a place of, 
well, things haven't been tried before. What if we did this? What if we tried this? What if we did that? Let's see how it works. The marketplace is the ultimate judge of what works and what doesn't. If it works, you build on it, you grow on it, you enhance it. If it doesn't work, you scratch it off and you start over somewhere else. So a lot of these things that were going on that when people see you making too much money, they come after you. They just don't like you making that kind of money. You got to be doing something wrong, right? Crazy, crazy way of thinking, but that's the way it is. So a lot of these laws that came into effect weren't in effect when these companies got started and they were regulated out of business. They were regulated completely out because they just weren't liked by some people. I can talk about this for days, but I'm not going to. We're going to keep this positive. But William Penn Patrick took a huge bullet with Holiday Magic. And people that know about Penn Patrick and Holiday Magic are quick to assume the worst because they, they gloss over the supported facts that are on the internet, which are a bunch of hokey, I can tell you from personal experience. I know the stories. I know what happened. And Ben Gay III knows what happened because he was the last president that Holiday Magic had, and he and William Penn Patrick were like that. Ben Gay was also a direct student of Napoleon Hill. William Penn Patrick actually hired Napoleon Hill to work with Ben, ben Gay III in his office as president of Holiday Magic. So imagine you go to work every day and sitting right there beside your desk is Napoleon Hill. <laughs> right there, right there telling you, okay, this is what you need to do. Let's work on this, whatever. I mean, it was... wow. And you talk about direct mentorship. You can't get more direct than three feet in front of your face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So Ben wow. Gay is another incredible human being that a lot of people who ha who weren't around because a lot of people think this whole network marketing thing got started five years ago. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're coming up on, on the century mark. OK, <laughs> quickly. But uh, the people who weren't around don't know that much about Ben Gay the third, but he is still around today and is an absolute treasure trove of stories because he knew all of these people. But uh, Penn Patrick uh, was fighting the good fight with uh, Holiday Magic. And I could tell you some really incredible stories or some fun things that happened. Maybe we'll get into it one day. But when Bill, Bill was, a, was a pilot and he liked to fly planes and uh, he was flying over his ranch in Cal San Rafael, California, I believe it's where it was. It was in California, I know for sure. And uh, he lost control of the plane that crashed into a mountain and killed him. Mm. So that, and then of course, after that holiday magic ceased to be. But uh, I think had he been able to, to live and fight, I think holiday magic would probably still be around today. But you know. Holiday, what, 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 was, the, what was their core product line? Cosmetics. Cosmetics, okay. Cosmetics. Uh, the, the story, uh, Bill was walking, uh, just taking a walk one day, and he passed this garage. And while he was deep in thought, he started smelling these fruit scents. Hmm. So he turned around and looked and went in to see what it was. And it was these fruit scented cosmetics. Wow. And the company was called Zoline, and they couldn't make it work, and they were going out of business. So Bill bought the entire inventory, bought their uh, bought their formulas, bought their sales aids, bought everything for twelve thousand five hundred dollars in nineteen sixty seven. Mm. Renamed the company Holiday Magic. I, I don't know how that happened. I would love to be able to find out how that name came about. But uh, that's how that whole thing got started. Fruit scented cosmetics. Wow, amazing! Yeah. Amazing. And there was one other guy in that group, which is I mean, just you know, for those of you who know network marketing, you know, the self-development space, you know, the impact of these names, all of these guys were at one company. That's the thing that blows me away, Ron. When I, when I, yeah. when I read this and, and all our conversations, uh, what a talent pool. Uh, but uh, the last guy, of course, is somebody who was almost like a, a surrogate uncle to you, uh, Zig Ziglar, who you knew <laughs> since you were five years old. And you shared that yeah. story last week. But just just in case, because sometimes we get new listeners or people miss the show, share the story how you, how you knew Zig, because uh, it, it's, it's remarkable. And, of course, he was remarkable. He's still remarkable. His name comes up 
every week on, uh, on a podcast or a conference call or a Zoom call. It's amazing Z- Zig's impact. Uh, of course, he was a Dallas boy like, like I now am. But oh, yeah. uh, talk about Zig, if you would, because that's a great story in itself. Zig had a great line about Dallas, Texas. He loved it in Dallas, Texas, and he would tell people, I'm not from here, but I got here as quick as I could. <laughs> <laughs> I, they even made a bumper sticker with that. I hope he got royalties or his family does. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Zig was, man, what can you say about Zig Ziglar? Uh, first of all, Zig also got started in Nutribio and knew Jim Rohn in Nutribio back in those days because Jim did so well with what he learned being under the direct mentorship of Earl Schoff and Rich Snackenberg that when Nutribio went out into Canada, decided to expand internationally, they handpicked Jim Rohn to be executive vice president of the entire Canadian division. Mm. So that's how that happened. But uh, Zig and Jim knew each other from those days. And of course, when Nutri- Jim, uh, uh, Zig did very well with Nutribio, when that company folded, he actually went with uh, Holiday Magic. Mm and was a very, very top producer in Holiday Magic. Uh, Ben Gay's got some really great stories about Zig and Holiday Magic. But another guy that came out of Holiday Magic was a man named Glenn W. Turner. And the entire Coscott and Dare to Be Great, all that stuff was Glenn Turner. They all got their start in Nutribio, I mean, uh, in uh, Holiday Magic. But Zig did very well in, in, uh, in Holiday Magic. And when that company was getting ready when it looked like all this trouble was coming, the way Ben Gay tells the story as Zig Ziglar had decided to be Zig Ziglar at that point. He decided to make it more than just new network marketing and really start focusing on the motivation and the success aspect of it. And uh, so learning everything that he learned in network marketing, he started selling cookware for a company called Salad Master. And I believe that's the same company that Bobby DePew sold cookware in. Mm. It was door to door. Zig called it selling pots and pans. That's what he did. He sold pots and pans. And he went door to door and built up even more sales skills, becoming num- the number two salesperson in the world in that entire organization. The only person that beat him was his brother, Judge. And if you've never heard of Judge Ziegler, yes, J U D G E. Ziggler, lick that dude up. He will blow socks off. But uh, he was the uh, Zig became the number two salesman in an entire Salad Master uh, cookware division. But before all that happened, which gets back to the story you were talking about, in 1968, my dad and my grandpa got involved in an opportunity called Automotive Performance out of Dallas, Texas. And it, my dad and grandpa both were car nuts. They were absolutely car crazy and anything they could do to build a motor, make it go faster, enhance performance. They were all about it. So when this opportunity rolled around, they sold a, a, a kit that you could put in the, in, in the hood of your car. Back in those days, you didn't have all the emission stuff and you had the engine sitting there and you had all kinds of room around the motor. So you could put this contraption down in there that actually was the very first ethanol type product that it was in this jar and it would get siphoned into your uh, carburetor and give you an extra boost to give you better performance. So they had built an entire opportunity around that. And my dad and my grandpa got started with that in 1968. Zig was the corporate trainer Mm. of that company. And uh, once they got introduced to Zig Ziglar, uh, the wheels came off. I mean, they, they went nuts with this thing. They found the business that they loved with a product that they loved because they were already car people and they just went nuts on this thing. They built the entire, they built the the largest organization in the entire Southeast. And because of that, Zig would fly over from Dallas, Texas and do special trainings for my dad and grandpa's group, which had quite sizable at that time. But I first, I was five years old in 1968. That's how I first got a hold of Zig Ziglar. Uh, I've still got the records over here in this cabinet that my dad and grandpa both played. One was the automotive performance opportunity, which talked a little bit more about what you could do in the business and how to apply what you learned. And then the other one was a record called biscuits, fleas and pump handles, which eventually became see you at the top. Mm -hmm. Those records were played constantly in my house, 
constantly in my house. And it got to, when you're five years old, you're a kid. If you hear something on TV over and over commercial or whatever it is, you start repeating it. Mm -hmm. You hear something on the radio over and over, you're a kid. You start repeating it. Well, with these records being played almost nonstop, being a five-year-old kid, I started repeating what I heard on the records, not even realizing. I just go around and start saying all this stuff. And pretty soon, my dad and grandpa thought it was the, the neatest thing in the world. And it wasn't long before they, they would have uh, meetings out in their garage, in, in the garage of our house that we had. And they would invite people over. And when this thing first got started, they would get me up in front of the room to give little zig talks to people. This little five-year-old kid, my grandpa would say, well, tell them what Zig has to say about this. And I'd fire it off. My dad would say, well, what about this? And I'd fire it off. It was just a neat little recruiting tool to use a five-year-old kid to give Zig talks. And people started actually bringing their kids to the opportunity meetings because of that. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger to where they started having to have them in hotels and things like that. But uh, yeah, that's Zig came into my life when I was five years old because of that. And I got to meet him when I was five and I'm, I'm pouring through my mother recently passed away and my dad passed away 12, 13 years ago, but I'm going through all of her stuff right now. Somewhere there was a black and white photo when Zig came to a, a training here in Atlanta uh, where he's down on one knee shaking my hand. I'm a little five-year-old kid and he's shaking my hand and it's, I, I, I know I can't get the picture out of my head on the screen or I would, but I know what the picture looks like because I've seen it. And of course I was there, but uh, yeah, I've got to find that picture that you talk about a key moment that, I mean, that that's it. That that's really sowing zig, zig sowing his thoughts and his philosophies into me at five years old. It changed my mind. It changed my entire life, John. I mean, it really did. It, it's, I shudder to think where I would be or who I would be today had I not been around the kind of people that I've been around my entire life hmm. because of what got started when I was five. Amazing. Amazing. Hey, just to, just to have known Zig and some of these other people, I mean, what, 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 a, what a privilege. And, and, you know, the guy we're going to talk about next to summarize today's call. Yes. Is somebody 1968 is an interesting year in the history of network marketing. I mean, there's so yes. many things that you referenced today and so many things we probably don't even have time to reference that happened, uh, including that the the, uh, the dissent decree was what year was that with family? 79, 79, 79. Yeah. Uh, so it was before I got started, but uh, I was in high school still. But 1968, a mutual friend of ours. OK, mutual friend, mentor. You know, he's a buddy. I mean, on top of everything yeah. else, Larry and I, you know, like yourself, I mean, we're friends. I mean, we do other things besides talk about network marketing because Larry, Larry is somebody that's up on what's going on in the world. You can have a conversation with Larry about stuff besides network marketing. And, and he's been a he's been a real good friend to me through the years. Uh, uh, we've been there for each other through a lot of personal stuff as well as business stuff. But uh, I got started. I, I met uh, Larry in 1983. Uh, I got started in the business April 18th, 1983. Uh, May 18th, 1983, I graduated college, Ron. And, and when I graduated college, Ronald Reagan, not another guy named Ron, by the way, was, uh, uh, I think, I think Nancy used to call him Ronnie though, but uh, anyway, <laughs> the rest of the world, we called him Ronald or, or I think he was Ron when he was young and as well as Dutch, but uh, he spoke at my college commencement. And, uh, it's funny because, um, and this is, this is funny knowing me today, but I was like an avowed socialist at that time. Um, I just thought that he was terrible. He had broken the, uh, the air traffic controllers union and, and all that stuff. I didn't want to go to my college commencement. And my father, who was a union guy, said, hey, you're going to go. We spent the money and you've got these loans and, and you're going to go, man. Like, like one way or another, you're going. I don't care whether he's there or not. You don't have to listen right. to him, but you know, we're going to go. So we went and I started, you know, and, and I don't know if people can see this or not, but I, I Mark Hughes used to talk about the guys that used to fold their arms and had all the answers and no money. That was me. Yeah. And I started at the back <laughs> of my chair and I'm not exaggerating by the end of Reagan's, probably his first paragraph when he talked about leadership, mentorship, freedom, and what made America unique in the rest of the world. I was up at the top of my chair and he did not finish talking. And he talked about, if you're going to be successful in life, you find a mentor, you find somebody who can teach you 
what it is that you want to know once that you have an interest. I mean, if you have no interest, you could be mentored by, you know, Tom Brady can teach you how to throw a football, but if you want to uh, play a violin, that's probably not going to do you a lot of good. Right. right. Uh, but anyway, so uh, president Reagan, my opinion, our greatest president to date in my lifetime, but anyway, I don't want to get political, but uh, Reagan talked about find a mentor, find somebody who can teach you what you want to know. 30 days later, I wind up in Hartford, Connecticut, myself, my upline, Tommy Husted, a uh, girl I was dating at the time, uh, three other guys, who were my first three distributors, as well as my, my then girlfriend. We go up there in this, this broken down station wagon. I mean, broken down. Had, you remember the cars when you had the hole in the floor and while you're oh, driving, yeah. you, you throw a penny, you know, through it to see if you could, you, you can know. look down and see the road go by. Exactly. <laughs> well, that was what we drove to Hartford and the six of us shared a room. Because we, you know, we're kids, right? I mean, we're just, you know, getting out of college, and nobody's got any money, so you know, six people in one bedroom, which, which. Well, we, you were used to dorm life, so. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and with all the sports I was into, I was always living out of a duffel bag, so I was fine with it. I don't know how the other people were, but anyway, it was an interesting weekend, and I'll never forget. All of a sudden, it's about a thousand people at this this uh, event in Hartford, and uh, all of a sudden, this rolling smoke comes up like they have in Vegas, right? The, the uh, dry ice, I guess they used to make that stuff. And anyway, so it comes up and I swear to God, I've told Taylor this many times. I've told Leah, Larry's uh, oldest daughter this many times. When they're introducing this guy and I'm about in the fourth row somehow, I don't know how I got up so close, but they're introducing this guy. And uh, I felt like we were in Vegas and that, that Elvis was coming on stage. And Larry comes out and, and, you know, and he's got the, you know, he's in great shape. He's still in great shape, by the way, for 70 plus years old, oh, he's taking care of himself. but uh, he comes out just big as life and he's just ripping it, man. He, Rest to the nines, you know, and he says one thing that I can quote in my sleep. And I believe it came from Jim. And that was for things to change. You have to change for things to get better. You have to get better. And I had never heard in my life, that kind of messaging from anybody, because I, I was always told, you know, the government was no good. Taxes were too high. This, that, the other thing, all the excuses. Okay. And all of a sudden I've got this idea of mentorship from president Reagan. I've got these 60 day experience in the company. I made some money, by the way, I made hundred dollars first month. So, you know, I've like, I had some success part-time. I'm just, you know, I'm working in a health club while I'm, while I'm, re, you know, getting out of college and, you know, I've got people that I know through sports and stuff. So I'm just selling product every day. I don't know about recruiting. I recruited some guys, but I mean, at the end of the day, my money was retail wholesale. Okay. It was real money. It was money made from selling product. And, sure. and I lost about 15 pounds on the product too. So I liked that. And then my energy was up and you know, everything was going real good. So anyway, I, I go to this meeting and this guy comes out and he just, man, I was like, wow. And I got him, I got Larry at another level that I had grown up in the construction world. My father was a union electrician. My uncles were union electricians. My grandfather was a union electrician, et cetera, wow. et cetera. So we wow. knew what hard work was. And I would sure. spend my summers and, and normally my uh, Christmas breaks uh, from school uh, as, as a uh, electrical helper. So I knew what hard work was. I knew what carrying pipe up four or five flights of stairs was and putting it on your shoulder and getting it up there and et cetera, et cetera. So when Larry came out and Larry sharing this long haired hippie, I didn't get that part i was too old i was too young for that i missed the 60s but when he got to long-haired hippie construction worker and i shook ding, his ding, hand ding, ding, ding. i shook his hand after the meeting and i said okay this boy's got some calluses this guy's done some real work in his life he, he's not just a guy with a nice you know suede shoe salesman in a nice suit and tie okay because you know larry knew how to dress certainly a lot better than i ever have but uh anyway um i, I was like i like the guy I res his he resonated with me and the message resonated with me and the philosophy resonated with me. Yeah. And of course, I, I, I was not successful with that company. I made some money. But of course, you know, the, some things happened with the FDA down the road and I never really made any money. And but but the message stayed with me permanently. And when I was really ready a few years later, that message and that training is what I started my first company with and became the number one distributor very, very quickly. And then, you know, one thing led to another and here I am 30 plus years later, but it was that message, but you've got your own Larry Thompson story and Ron, we're going to have Larry on with us next week, discussing 1968 and going forward. Man, and I can't wait. That's going to be something else. Who knows where, where that's going to end up going. 
get the three of us together in, on the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, uh, man, uh, Larry and I have a lot of similarities. Uh, Larry got started in uh, May the 4th, 1968. A friend of his named Mike Fuller called him up, and Larry later found out that Larry was the absolute last guy that Mike called. Mike had gone through everybody on his list, but his sponsor was in town. Larry Huff was his name. And Larry Huff was in town and told Mike Fuller, you bring somebody to this meeting. And he had gone through, he had exhausted everybody that he knew. And in a last ditch effort, right before the meeting was get, getting ready to get going, he called Larry. You know, and you know the whole deal of Larry said, well, let, let, me, let me, I'll call you right back. He had to see if he could get his hair going and all that kind of stuff. He called him back and said, you know, yeah, let's go. So they, they picked him up and uh, he, he put on his best hippie beads, you mm -hmm. know, walked into the room with his long hair and his long beard, like ZZ Top, you know. And uh, he said people walked in the room and they thought they were hallucinating because back then you didn't see people like him in a business meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, he sat down, to, he'd never been to a hotel in his life before that. And he said, that's one of the main reasons that he went, not so much for the business meeting, just so he could go into a hotel that he passed all the time and get to see what it looked like inside. But uh, he sits down and everybody leaves. Everybody scoots over this way and they scoot over that way. And he sits there and listens. And, uh, you know, Bobby DePew comes out and talks. It was Bobby's meeting. Uh, the, Bill Bailey comes out and talks and they share this message of what the company is, what you can learn, and Bobby laid something on Larry that had a lot that, that Larry still talks about with us today. That is the perfect summation of managing expectations for anybody who gets started. Bobby, after he laid out everything that had happened with him and all these uh, distributors got up and uh, talked about what had happened to them, Bobby said, if only 10% happens for you that happened for us, it will be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. And Larry said that really struck a chord with him. And uh, this was the Larry Huff is the guy who was Mike Fuller's sponsor. After it was all over and done with, Mike comes walking up to Larry and Larry Huff is right behind him. And Larry Huff is the one that looked at Larry Thompson and said, you don't want to do this, do you? Shaking his head back and forth. And Larry said, yes, I do. So, Thank goodness he said yes that day, right? So somehow, some way, and I, I need to ask Larry about this. I don't know whatever happened to Mike Fuller. I don't know if, if he be, became successful or if he dropped out. Every time we talk about things, we always go off on these, these avenues, and I forget to talk about what I meant to talk about. But uh, Mike Fuller is one of them, so help me remember. Okay. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me make a note of that. I'll quote Tom Hopkins. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. But uh, yeah, Bobby DePew saw something in Larry. And of course, that meeting that night was Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn had been invited by Bobby DePew. They had all this history together with uh, Nutribio. And uh, when Best Line rolled, rolled around, they had been keeping in touch. Jim had been looking for things to do and uh, not sure how to put his talents to work, but knowing that he wanted to. He finally accepted Bobby's invitation to come to the meeting that night. And it's really interesting when you look back at how, how all of this came to be. And can you imagine, you, you, what if you could be in a time machine and go back and just go sit in a corner <laughs> and watch Larry Thompson walk in? <laughs> watch Jim Rohn walk in. Watch these two notice each other and meet each other for the first time. And think of everything that has come out of all of that. And that would be one of the neatest moments that you could ever go to just to see that happen. And of course, Larry made several hundred dollars within a couple of weeks. And he was just on fire about this thing. And, you know, the rest, as I say, is history. He, everything that he learned that was poured into start. That's why at the end of that, that introduction, I say we're all part of California vitamins mm -hmm. all the way down. Mm -hmm. Everything that got poured into those guys that they poured into Larry is what the millionaire training was. Mm -hmm. 
Larry was 35 years old when he hit that stage at the Bonaventure Hotel, February of 1981. So everything that had been poured into him is what he poured out. He put his own little spin on things, his own little nuances to it, but it's the basic things that he learned from, from Bobby and from Jim directly and everything that they had learned from everybody else. So, uh, man, uh, as far as Larry is concerned, about three months later, in, on May the, May the 1st, it was Friday, May the 1st, 1981, I was working at a corner gas station right across. If you know anything about Atlanta at all, there's a big mall here called Cumberland Mall. Mm -hmm. And right across the street from Cumberland Mall used to be a Chevron station owned by Tony Little, Jim and Tony Little. And uh, I worked for them. I, I would, you know, do oil changes and things like that. And I pumped gas and did all that stuff. I was just trying to find something to do. This lady comes up and I, to this day, I haven't been able to find out who she is and I haven't been able to ask uh, Trish, but I'm going to, or Tish rather. Her name was either Margaret or Marg or Marge or Marjorie or something like that. She came up in her station wagon and went up to Tony Little and said, look, I've got these products that I'm trying to sell. Do you mind if I pull my car over here in the corner of the parking lot and try to move, you know, sell some of these products? And uh, he said, sure, no problem at all. So she goes over there and sets out these little canisters on her tailgate and puts some signage up, homemade signs and things like that. And I was watching her for a couple of hours and I thought on my lunch break, I'll go over and see what this is all about. And I did. She's told me about the company, told me about the products. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't have very many at that time. They had, they had a few, you know, the vitamins and the, and the stuff. And uh, she said, if you sign up as a distributor, you get 25% off. And I thought, huh. And then she said, if you think this is something that you would like to learn more about, we actually have a training tomorrow. This was, been, this was Friday, so tomorrow would have been the Saturday training. And uh, I said, well, okay, uh, give, give, me, give me the kit here. Give me the whole thing. So I signed up, got the whole thing, took it home, drank the shake. It was pretty good. Took the other tablets and started feeling, feeling better. So I thought, hey, maybe there's something to this. So I go to the meeting, remembering everything that I had learned from my dad and my grandpa all these years ago. I'm 17 years old at this point. I met Zig when I was five. I met Jim Rohn when I was 14. Three years later, I was 17 years old looking for a place to put this to work. So at that meeting was the very first time I ever heard the name Larry Thompson. And I found out that I was in his downline and Tish Roshin's downline. Mm. And Millionaire Training had just come out. Three had just been recorded three months before. And they were just blasting these cassettes out to the field. And I always tell Larry, I apologize. But the very first time I ever heard you it was a copy of Millionaire Training on a Memorex cassette tape because they couldn't get them out quick enough. So people were making copies, just real crappy copies, too. I mean, you could hear it, but it, it sounded horrible. But you could get the gist of what was being said. And, uh, man, I know you and I both and Roberti and Weisberg and all of us has, have worn out how many sets of cassette plate <laughs> tapes over the years. I mean, I would play them till the brown was gone off the tape, you know, <laughs> and then you'd start in on another one. But yeah, th that's the very first time I ever heard uh, Larry's name. And then uh, it was about a year later at a supervisor school when I met him for the first time. And uh, it's just been, and it's another thing uh, of the major influences in my life. Zig at five, of course, other than my dad and my grandpa. And then Jim Rohn at 14. And then meeting Larry when I was 18. Those three things set me on the path that is, is just I, I shudder to think where I would be today had those men and their their ideas and their messages and their enthusiasm and their outlook if that had not come into my life I shudder to think where I would be and, and I'm sure you do too sure well I'll tell you what 1983 because I, I was at a weird point I was either going to go I was graduating college we're coming off the Carter years right Reagan still yeah making the economy eventually recover, <clears throat> but it was still a mess. Interest rates. Yeah, I mean, and you'd go out, you know, you'd go out for a job interview and people would say, well, you know, you're a kid, you don't know anything. And, 
you know, got no real experience. So I, I was selling health club memberships. So I was making a little bit of money with that, but that wasn't a career. That wasn't something I, I wanted to do. And I had a, you know, I mean, I worked hard to go to college. I mean, I, I you know, spent a lot of time and money and I was, a, I was a good student. I mean, I was, a, you know, graduated with honors from college and it was like, but there was nothing there. So I was thinking of going to the Marine Corps. To tell you the truth, I had an option to go to the Marine Corps. And the same week that I was talking to the Marine Corps recruiter, I was down in Virginia. I was, I was, I was, I was at a, what's called a Sambo wrestling tournament. It's a combination of freestyle wrestling uh, and judo. And I had done both sports. So it's my first Sambo tournament. Uh, okay. Not to be, not to be confused with uh, Samba dancing folks. I'm a lousy dancer, but uh, anyway, uh, one of the fellows I competed against had been in the Marine Corps for many years and he was also a recruiter. And he gave me the Marine Corps layout. And I was like, you know, my my uh, my dad didn't serve, but all my uncles had uh, mostly World War Two. And my my one uncle in Korea had uh, uh, got the Purple Heart for getting shot. So I came from a long line of military people on that side. My mother's side, same thing, all career officers, Coast Guard, et cetera. Anyway, so I like hey, I like the idea. I like the discipline. You know what I mean? And so I was thinking, okay, I'm going in there. And ironically, Ron, it was about three days later i think it was a wednesday because i got back on sunday and i got on Patigo on top of it because we borrowed geese believe it or not it's a story in itself i got sick as a dog with this skin rash and oh. i had to go to the doctor and all kinds of stuff but anyway i think it was wednesday the tommy Houston comes to my office okay and i was working for a guy named dave Przansky. And uh, Dave Przansky uh, uh, was a world-class wrestler. It actually tied Dan Gable, the, the great Dan Gable, uh, heck of an athlete himself. But anyway, so I'm working for Dave and Tommy comes in. Tommy was, was a two-time New Jersey state wrestling champ. So I had great respect for these guys. They were both legends in, in the sport that I still to this day love. And anyway, Tommy comes in and he starts telling me, Hey, for 32 bucks, you can join this thing. And I'm thinking, start a business as opposed to going into Marine Corps. What, what, what sounds like easier? Well, I think, I think starting a business does. And, but uh, that's the day. I, and, and I, and I gave Tommy a check for $32 on the spot. And I said, can you hold the check till Friday? And I didn't tell him what Friday, I just put Friday on the check. <laughs> and I dated the check. For, we still laugh about that. <laughs> it's still good buddies. He lives over in Thailand now, but uh, we laugh about that, that, that hot check that I gave him. There's no way in the world I had $32 <laughs> in my checking account, but, but yeah, to your point, those things happened for a reason in my life. And, you know, here I wind up, you know, 60 days later, going and and meeting larry and hearing him and i mean i, I was a nobody I, mean, I was just a kid but because i was a big guy okay I, I i always had a way to get through a crowd so it was like yeah. afterwards there's a bunch of people standing around they used to put the product out so you can take as many handfuls of product as you want at these meetings so i wound up basically uh there and here comes larry thompson and i'm like i'm gonna make a beeline for this guy i'm not gonna knock anybody over but i'm gonna make sure i want to meet i want to meet this guy like, yeah. I want to make sure he's as real as he seemed on the stage. And he was just as real, just as personable, just as down to earth, aggressive. I mean, you don't get where you where he was even at that point in his career without being aggressive and know what you're doing. But uh, I liked him and uh, I liked the company. I liked Mark uh, when I met him as well. And, and uh, you know, uh, unfortunately. Very easy to like, both of yeah, them. Yeah, both, they're both real. I mean, bottom yeah. line is, and, and most of the people in our industry are real. I mean, the, the, the real ones are real. Let's put it that way. But uh, I, I just had so much fun with him. We had so much fun since. I mean, we've done all sorts of things together, ball games, and I don't know how many lunches and breakfasts we've eaten together, but a ton over the years. And, and uh, we've kept some restaurants and business here in Dallas over the years, certainly. And, uh, but uh, he's, 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 a, he's just a great guy. He's a great friend. He's been, been a blessing to my life. And like I said, you know, sometimes when you are in the self-development world, which is what you're in and I'm in and Larry's really in, right? Because to that paraphrase about, Hey, you know, this is a self-development business with a pay plan. That's yeah. what it really is. The products and a pay plan. plan. Yeah. And, yeah. and you go down that road and things happen in your life uh, is when you recognize the value of what people say. And I'll give you, we can kind of close here on my end, Ronald, I'll give you the last word. And then we'll, we'll, we'll meet with Larry next week. But uh, my oldest daughter, um, who is now 20, she'll be 26 this year. And she's, thank God she's doing well, so I can tell this story. But she got herself in some trouble, uh, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. Uh, 
and uh, changed her life since. I'm so proud of her. Uh, but we were at a, I'll backtrack for a minute. We were at a event with Bill Bartman a number of years ago with Bill Bartman and Robert Kim Kiyosaki here in Dallas. Okay. And Kimi was probably 10 years old and she's very short. So Larry and I and, and, and Kimmy went to this thing uh, and I brought Kimmy because I just wanted her to be around the, the influence of some major sure. people and the Kiyosaki's a great people that Bill Bartman was, I think he's passed away. Unfortunately, he was a heck of a guy, not network marketing people, of course, but they're, you know, closely aligned. Anyway, we went to this thing and um, Larry and tell you the kind of guy he is he's like, there's no way in the world this kid's going to be able to see from back here. He walks to the front of the room grabs a chair sticks my daughter in that chair says sit here kid right in front of the stage so during the course of the day so cool. kim kiyosaki comes out to speak and she sees this little kid right and the event ends actually i i i want to say Stuart johnson had something to do with that event i might be wrong about that i forget who sponsored i think it was a Stuart yeah. but anyway so my, my daughter winds up in the front row. Kim notices her. We go to the after party event that night and Kim notices her again, comes up to me and says, do you mind if I borrow your daughter? Sure. Wow. My daughter spends the night with, with, with hanging out with Kim and Robert Kiyosaki and sitting at their table. I'm sitting back with Larry, like we're sitting back in the back row, you know, like, like, you know, we're back there with, you know, you know, sitting next to each other like this. And, yeah. and here's my kid. She's up front with Kim Kiyosaki and Robert Kiyosaki. It was an amazing, wow. amazing experience. But that was Larry was Larry was proactive. And he yeah. said, Hey, there's no way this kid's going to enjoy this or hear anything of value back here. We're taking her to the front. And that was Larry. And, and I, I admire that about him because that's the kind of guy he is. But when my daughter got a little bit of a problem a couple of years ago, and like I said, thank God it's resolved so I can, I can share this story. And it's been, been God's blessing on, on her life. And she's doing amazing things and just doing so well. But what's funny is when she was getting out of the rehab that she was in, she looked at me, I looked at her and she said, I know what you're going to say, dad, day at a time, brick at a time, process by process is how we're going to beat this thing. That ain't multi-level. No, nope. that's life. Much it's bigger. Personal. Multi-levels of business. That's life. And that was, a. and I called Larry on the way home. I was in tears. I called Larry oh, to share imagine. that with him. And I must have heard Larry say that a hundred times if I heard him say it once. And it, and it goes back to the, you know, to the construction business, right? I mean, how do you build a building? You know, day at a time, brick at a time, process by process. Yeah. But that resonated and carried over to something so much more important than just sponsoring another distributor or building another team or gaining another rank or getting another recognition at your company event. All important. Yes. But nowhere near as important as the impact that that statement had in her progression of events in her life. So anyway, I'm going to let you have the last word, Ron. I know you certainly have one as well. Well, I mean, just to kind of build on what you talked about earlier and what I alluded to earlier is I tell people get going in a network marketing business because this, the life skills you will learn, not just about business, but about life, these universal life tools and life skills and attitudes and ideas will absolutely change your life. It sounds hokey when you say that because this will change your life. That'll change your life. People use it so much. It doesn't have the impact that it should. But even I tell people, even if you completely bomb out and never make a dime, you will walk away a better person from being exposed to these ideas. Uh, that's just what it is. And, and I, I hear stories like what you shared all the time, especially when it comes to what Larry has taught us. Larry's DNA is all over this profession, all over. People who don't even know they have been mentored indirectly by Larry have been mentored indirectly by Larry. And those of us who know him and can call him friend as well as mentor get to see a bigger picture of Larry than a lot of people get to see. Larry's the real deal. And that is why I'm so excited about next Friday because there's going to be the three of us on here. And I guarantee you, we're all going to feed off of each other. You're going to say something and Larry's going to have something. And then I'll say something. Larry's we'll just, we'll be like this round Robin thing. It's going to be so exciting. And 
what what creates a great conversation are great questions. Just like the questions you've asked me today were just incredible, and that got me going. If you don't ask good questions, nothing's going to come of it. The things that the three of us know, the questions that we can ask each other directly and about and of each other are going to make the next show just one for the books, man. It's going to be something incredible. I, I can't wait to be a part of it. Heck, I, I would sit over in the corner and let you and Larry go, you know. <laughs> It's just, it's just incredible. People don't understand how real that, like you said, the real people are real. And uh, I don't know, man, I can't thank you enough for having me on and for letting me share some uh, of the history of this profession that I love so much. I have a passion for it. I can't not do it. It seems like every day I'm thinking of some aspect of it, how to capture it, how to display it, how to teach it how to share it with people in a meaningful way. And I appreciate you and, and for allowing me to come on. And I'm really, especially for two weeks in a row. And then next Friday, the wheels are going to come off. Yep. Yep. It's going to be so much fun. I can't wait. Well, and, and the other thing is too, I, I want to interview Ben Gay with you too. Ben Gay the third. I need, yeah. I need to see if I can get a hold of Ben. I think, you know? I think Ben will do that. I think yeah. he would. Well, just, you know, I mean, Larry and Ben, I mean, they're, they're, they're icons. They're, they're, they're both, thank God, they both have a nice long lives and they're both yeah. have so much of the history. And it's so, you know, it's just so important that people get, you know, not only these guys impact, but the history lessons that they can share. And, and honestly, I, I'm going to be sending this when, it, when this is all done. These hopefully four interviews, the two we've done already, plus the one with, with Larry, of course, next week, and and hopefully the one with Ben. Uh, I, I'm going to be sending this to my company owner just to say, hey, you know what? You're 42 years old and you're you're doing amazing stuff, but I want you to be here when you when when I'm pushing up daisies. I want this company to still be here for my my legacy. Uh, but more than that, hey, learn from some of the mistakes that some of these guys made. I mean, neutral new talking about neutral bio today, Ron, that company could have been the Amway or the Herbalife very easily with that level of talent. With, when neutral bio, when they got going, they became the newspapers called them a national mania mm. because they were out selling neutral light, abundant Vita Shackley, all of them combined. Mm. They were out selling and growing people, I mean, they were up to 115,000 distributors before you could bat your eye. Unreal. Yeah, I mean, and we're talking about the late 50s. Like, we're talking about a whole deal here. But, uh, yeah, it's just uh, the whole thing. I wish we had uh, could get into how Nutribio folded and that whole deal. But uh, it's just, it was crazy. But, you know, the meeting, I'm kind of proud to be from Atlanta but sometimes I hear some things about Atlanta that make me quit, that make me cringe. And when Rich Snackenberg told me that the begin of the fall of Nutribio started in Atlanta because the FDA had snuck agents in to a, to a, a meeting and all the guy said, he, he had a wheelchair off to the side of the stage. That's it. And all he said at that meeting was, since I've been on these products, I don't need that wheelchair anymore. Mm. That's all he said. The FDA shut the meeting down, confiscated all the products, and said, you've mislabeled it. Wow. That was the beginning of the end, and they they just they did this whole smear campaign. Have you ever seen the movie, uh, uh, what's that guy's name? The, the Tucker, Preston Tucker. It's called Tucker, A Man in His Dreams. The Jeff Bridges is in it. No. no. Tucker created the car in 1948 called the Tucker Torpedo. Hmm. Go find that movie, John. It's called Tucker, A Man and His Dream. Jeff Bridges is the star of that movie. Now, when you watch that movie, you and I will be able to have, and anybody else who watches that movie will be able to have a comprehensive discussion on how Nutribio got railroaded the same way Preston Tucker got railroaded by the government. Interesting. Yeah. So it was a whole complete thing. After Nutribio was shut down, Rich didn't want to give up. Earl wanted completely out of the, the, the supplement business, which was fine. Earl and Jim Rohn were going to start their own company called BioLite. Mm. And they got shut down before they could ever get the thing off the ground. Death threats. 
people calling and threatening their lives. They say, we know where your kids go to school. You're not going to launch this thing. Wow. So erring on the side of caution, they stopped. It got nasty. But watch that movie and you'll get an understanding of what happened to New Tobio. I will. Well, Ron, this, this has been amazing. I'm looking forward to next week. And, and, and then hopefully a week oh, yeah. later, we can do, do uh, Ben, is hopefully as well. But we're definitely doing we'll Larry. Larry has con- confirmed. I had breakfast with him the other day, and he's excited about uh, about this and pumped up, which, which means you and I could both probably sit somewhere else and just let him go. <laughs> oh, all we have to do is wind him up and just sit back. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell Taylor, put the key in his back and just go, Larry, go, man. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, It'll, it'll be a lot of fun. But, Ron, I want to thank you. And just in signing out today, the name of our show, Leaving Nothing to Chance, every Tuesday, a new podcast comes up on Spotify, on Apple, on iTunes. On now, uh, seven other networks, by the way, have picked this up. I'm glad to say uh, the name of my books that I've written, Leave Nothing to Chance, uh, is available on Amazon as we speak, digital, Spanish, uh, as well as uh, hard copy, of course. And, of course, uh, uh, last year's uh, book, uh, both, by the way, Amazon. Amazon bestsellers uh, moving up 2020. That's still available as well. And if you haven't read it, it's got a lot of concepts in it. Okay. That uh, you can share with, with your team. So once again, I want to thank everybody. Hey, keep listening to these shows. This is becoming a living classroom of network marketing. Ron Henley, my friend, I want to thank you again for just incredible insights, information, knowledge, and really being a living history of, of our industry. So thank you again for everything you do. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Leave Nothing to Chance. If you want to know more about what it takes to succeed in the network marketing space, join us again next week for another amazing episode. For additional resources and to connect with John Soliter, visit leavingnothingtochance.com. Don't forget to leave a review, and we'll see you next time.